The sitting is resumed and it's time now for questions to the Minister of Social Development and we will start with listed questions. The following questions have been withdrawn, 7, 8, 13 and 14. Daniel McCrossan is not in his place. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number two. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. New housing benefit notifications were launched in September 2015 for new claims and change of circumstances. This followed consultation with tenants groups and advice sector agencies such as Housing Rights Service. The new housing benefit notification were improved and simplified with a number of modifications, including one expanded notes to include illustrative examples of how charges are calculated and explanations of some of the terminology used, two clearly showing the amount of rent rates and housing benefit due to the top of the notification, three, a single housing benefit notification is now issued setting out the latest circumstances rather than multiple notifications if a number of changes have taken place, and four, Claimants are reminded in the notes that they can request a formal decision notice or written statement of reason if required. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. I have many elderly constituents who continue to struggle with letter after letter from the Housing Executive, which, despite recent changes, continue to be confusing and complex. This often leads elderly tenants into arrears through absolutely no fault of their own. So can I ask what assurances can the Minister give that these letters will eventually be provided in plain English to help those who simply wish to live in their homes paying the correct amount each month? Well, I thank the member for her question and her supplementary. And can I say that I too share her frustrations uh, because we all have uh, constituents who come to us and come sometimes very confused because they get a lot of literature and it is very difficult at times to interpret it. But I can tell the member today that a concentrated effort is being made uh, to regularise this and pull this all together into, into a single document. And I hope that as a result of that, there, she will and her constituents see a marked improvement in the service and a document that is easily understood. But if the member has a particular case that she wants to talk to me about, I'm quite happy to do that. Thank you. I call Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his response so far. Could the Minister outline to the House what are the effects of the changes regarding backdating housing benefit? Well, I thank Mr. Douglas for his question also. Um, the, the Chancellor, in, in his summer budget from that from April 2016, housing benefit claims would be backdated for a maximum of one month. And under the existing provision, claimants can request backdating of housing benefit for six months. The decision to reduce the period of, to one month is in line with changes in GB. Universal credit, when it is implemented later this year, only provides for one month backdating of claims provided the claimant can demonstrate good cause. Moving on, I call Judith Cochran. Question number three, please. I recognise that certain aspects of liquor licensing law in Northern Ireland are in need of reform. The proposals outlined in the Way Forward report require changes to primary legislation. Since my appointment in January, I have focused on competing priorities such as welfare reform and two housing bills. And unfortunately, at this stage, there is insufficient time to progress a bill to amend the law in the current mandate. Any changes to the law on liquor licensing will fall to the new Department for Communities to consider after the Assembly elections in May. I call Judith Cochran. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Bird, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister um, for his answer and, and thank him for engaging with me uh, recently on my private member's bill and licensing. During uh, the progress of that bill, it's become clear that there are a number of other issues that weren't um, consulted on back in 2012, um, such as microbreweries and under 18s on licensed premises, etc. And I could ask the Minister um, if he um, would ask his department now um, to progress a much wider consultation process so that in the next mandate, um, that uh, better legislation, more um, modern legislation can be taken forward in this regard. I thank the member for her, her question. And, and can I say that uh, as a result of the work that she has been doing in re around this issue, there are a lot of matters that have come to a head and there is no doubt that there is a case, strong case for a holistic look at licensing legislation here in Northern Ireland. However, uh, at the expense of repeating myself, I have said that uh, this will not be done in this mandate, and that will be for those who ever are here come the other side of the elections. And I would suspect that in the new mandate, this is a matter that will be given consideration, and uh, I think that uh, it is now somewhat overdue that, in fact, liquor licensing which is important no matter what stance you take in relation to this particular issue. And I may not always agree with the, the particular member or indeed other members around this House in relation to what is the best way forward, but no doubt there has to be a movement forward uh, to deal with this particular issue. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Alex Maskey. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, could I uh, thank the Minister for giving his answer so far, and I certainly do not expect the Minister to be able to project ahead in the next mandate, and he can't speak for people in the next mandate, but would the Minister not agree that it is very regrettable that notwithstanding his own department's previous consultations with the wider sectors out there, that it is regrettable that we have not had a holistic review of uh, licensing uh, legislation within this current mandate, given the importance that, that would have had to the uh, tourism and the local jobs sectors? Well, Mr. Speaker, I've heard what the, the, the member has said, uh, but very often this House is accused of not doing legislation. But that is the very reason that this particular legislation is not going through in this mandate, is because of the pressure on the legislative timetable. And I am sure he will agree with me. What is not or could not be achieved in four and a half years I don't think there's any member around here expects me to deal with it in four and a half weeks. I call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister why he has not brought forward a, a gambling reform bill? The Minister may or may not wish to answer that question. Right, thank you. Well, I could give the short answer again. In, in relation to that, because of the, the, the time, the uh, lack of time, uh, and the pressures that are on the legislative timetable. But during the current mandate, my department was faced with other competing priorities, uh, such as the welfare reform, which is a very big issue, of course, and bringing forward two housing bills, which I have referred to earlier. Uh, both I and my predecessors were therefore unable to bring progress a gambling bill as intended. I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for, for his answers uh, so far in relation to the reform of the licensing laws, and I offer no criticism of him whatsoever. But the Minister will realise that the Executive had this issue on their table since 2012. And as we speak today, uh, young people, tens of thousands of them, are in fact being told they have committed criminal offences because they are on licensed premises after 9 p.m., when in fact those licensed premises are not selling alcohol, have a controlled environment, have staff uh, trained in child abuse and all the other things. Can he assure this House that this crazy situation it won't last for much longer? Well, uh, I hear what the member says. And uh, I hear also the frustration in his voice. But as a previous uh, speaker has said, I cannot give 
any guarantee as to what the new Assembly will do following the election. Uh, because one, I don't know who will be here, and if someone can stand up today and tell me who the, all the 108 are going to be, then I would be interested in talking to them outside this Assembly. But I think that the point has been made, and well made, that there is an issue here that needs to be addressed. And I don't think that anyone, uh, whether they are in my position or previous ministers, are trying to hide away from that. There is an issue that needs to be addressed, not least the very issue that he raises. And I think that there will and is a responsibility on the future House, the future Assembly, to address that issue. And I, like him, look forward to that matter being addressed. Thank you. I call John McAllister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and I hear what the Minister says, and, and I'm grateful to him for his replies, and that he is a difficulty that there's such a short period left. But I would like to draw his attention to uh, microbreweries that have grown up over the last number of years. I have a number of them in the South Down constituency that really do need um, to make it viable, to make sampling days uh, an attractive part of our entire tourist product. That is something that really needs to be looked at. And I'd urge that the Minister leave some of that uh, with his department and for, his, for whoever succeeds him in his office. Can he pledge to do that? Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I can give him one pledge that I leave it to the new, whoever is coming in behind me. I have no bother in giving that pledge. I am not quite sure that that is the answer that he wants. But yes, you have my pledge that I will leave it to the next minister that is coming in. And I think the rest of the, you know, we can turn this one round 101 times, but we're going to come back to the same situation, and it is the time factor. But the point is well made that the matter has to be addressed, and I don't think anyone's shying away from that, or no one's in denial about that. Moving on, I call Jim Allister. Question four. Mr. Deputy Speaker, at the outset, it is important to state that we fully expect some existing disability living allowance recipients who are suffering from conflict-related injuries to successfully migrate from DLA to personal independence payment, or now known as PIP, and they will not need to avail of the migration mitigation measure. And could I emphasise this? The particular proposal referred to is not my department's proposal nor is it mine either. It was one of the many mitigation measures recommended by the working group led by Professor Everson, which published its report on the 18th of January. <coughs> the report and its recommendations were endorsed at the executive meeting on the 21st of January, and I have been asked by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister Office to take forward the implementation of all the recommendations in the report. Both in her report and more recently in evidence to the Social Development Committee, Professor Everson explained that her rationale for including this in the package of mitigation measures was that it is intended to address a concern that the new personal independence payment assessment may not fully capture the consequences for claimants in Northern Ireland of conflict-related injury, in particular mental health issues. In that scenario, Professor Everson recommended existing DLA claimants who are refused personal independence payment but score four points should be awarded four additional points to confer entitlement to a supplementary payment for one year only. This is not an entitlement to per personal independence payment. I call Jim Allister for supplementary. <clears throat> Whatever the obfuscation about the genesis of this proposal, the fact is this proposal has been adopted by the executive and the minister, and it's the minister which will bring forward the regulations to implement it. Is the minister not ashamed that he intends to bring forward a proposal whereby a terrorist, a victim maker, who injured himself by his own hand in planting a bomb will possibly be in the position of benefiting from an extra four points in order to secure and maintain his benefits. And if the minister 
isn't ashamed of that. He should be, because it is an obnoxious the member or an obscene asked this proposal. Question. Will the minister undertake to exempt from the regulations he brings those terrorists who self-inflicted injuries? Um, in reply, can I, can I say to the member that um, he may feel that he is the only person in Northern Ireland, and certainly the only one in this House, that has any conscience around these issues? And let me say this: I suspect if you jig as brave and deep, you will find that my views are not much different from your views. However. I suspect the question has more to do with gaining some cheap political points rather than trying to deal with real issues. And unfortunately, as a minister, I have to deal with real issues. I don't have the luxury of being critical on everything that comes across my desk. I wish sometimes I could, but let me assure the member that if there are inadequacies here, it will be my intention to do everything in my power to ensure that those who are deserving of it get it, and those who are not deserving of it do not get it. I call Alex Atwood. Mr. To clarify a point that he made in his opening answer, when he, as I understand it, said that it was anticipated that some people on, uh, who had suffered conflict-related injuries would migrate across to PIP. Some claimants. It's always, Minister, been the assumption that the vast majority of people migrating across to PIP with conflict-related injuries would do so. Are you now sending a message to victims and survivors that it will be a smaller number rather than a larger number of those with conflict-related injuries that will migrate to PIP? compared to what was believed to be the case heretofore? Um, Mr Speaker, let me make it very clear to the member that has asked the question that those who have suffered innocent victims, there is no attempt on my part or my department to deprive those people of any benefit that they are entitled to. And what I want to say to the member who at one time perhaps sat in a similar seat to I'm sitting in. If he has got a case that he wants to come and talk to me, then let him come and talk to me. I look forward to hearing about it. I suspect I'll not. Moving on, I call Dolores Kelly. <clears throat> Question five, please, Minister. <clears throat> um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I had a very successful meeting uh, with the uh, member and the chief executive of Shankill Lurgan Community Partnership on the 3rd of February. Amongst the issues that we discussed was an application from the SLCP for social housing enterprise funding from the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. The application requested assistance for capital renovations of five flats at Mount Zion House that are owned by Choice Housing as well as funds for furniture and for professional fees. The Northern Ireland Housing Executive informed the SLCP via email on 5 February 2016 that their application was unsuccessful. A letter detailing the decision will follow, outlining the reasons why and how the Housing Executive's social investments team can engage with them going forward. In addition, I have asked my officials to continue to engage with the SLCP to consider alternative solutions for the five vacant properties at Mount Zion House. I call Dolores Kelly for supplementary. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Deputy Speaker. And yes, the Minister did uh, visit and uh, I'm very grateful to him for spending so much time uh, with uh, the uh, largely voluntary board of Shankill Lurgan Community Projects. Um, I'm pleased to hear that he will be keeping his eye on the ball in relation to the progress of this case. Uh, there are 
150 people in the area of North Lurgan on a waiting list. So does the Minister agree with me that it's of the utmost urgency uh, that the Housing Executive and all others involved in this particular case put their maximum effort into ensuring that these apartments, and I think there are 18 in total, but five that require remedial work, are put back into immediate use to alleviate the severe housing crisis in North Lurgan? Um, Deputy Speaker, can I say to the member that uh, housing is a very emotive issue in Northern Ireland. There is a big demand for social sector housing. We have a, a waiting list, I think, running at some 40,000 at the moment, of which about 50 per cent of that are stress housing. And I think it is important that where there are opportunities uh, arise that can be availed of to ensure that vacant properties are used to the maximum, then I have no hesitation in supporting that. Now, I know it's easy standing here today saying that. It's quite another thing putting it in action. But I certainly will give an assurance to the member that this will be looked at, and if it is possible at all and viable uh, to do it, then it will be done, because I don't think there's any merit whatsoever and properties sitting vacant while people are sitting long time on waiting lists. Moving on, I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number six. Thank you, Deputy <coughs> Speaker. With the new state pension being introduced from the 6th of April 2016 and affecting anyone reaching state pension age on or after that date, my department has launched a multi-channel advertising campaign, which initially ran through the month of October 2015. This campaign has proved successful, showing a significant increase in online activity as the viewers sought further information. A second phase of the same campaign is scheduled to take place from this week, that is the 15th of February, and will again be delivered across various advertising platforms. This phase will run continuously until the end of March. I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for that uh, information. The Minister will be aware of the concerns, uh, I suppose, right across the community. I wonder, could the Minister be definitive in terms of what changes actually might uh, we expect? Well. Deputy Speaker, the, the Pensions Act Northern Ireland 2015 makes provisions in relation to the introduction of a new state pension, uh, an option to allow current pensioners and people who reach state pension age before 6th of April 2016 to increase their income in retirement by making a new voluntary Class 3A national insurance contribution. Uh, this additional pension amount will be known as state pension top-up. Furthermore, the requirement to have 35 qualifying years national insurance contributions or credits to receive the full new year uh, state pension amount and the accelerated timetable to increase state pension to age 67 and the introduction of a bereavement support payment and changes to private pensions. I call Patsy McLaughlin. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Could, could the Minister advise us um, what resources uh, are being provided or will be provided to the advice sector to help people, uh, particularly pensioners or those who are about to be pensioners, uh, work their way through what can be quite often a very complex maze of entitlements? Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, yes, uh, th that is an important issue, and uh, it, there will be uh, support put in places uh, as this rolls out. And I would say to the member, if, there, if he has concerns around this one again, that he knows personally in his own constituency where there are issues arising generally, then I want to hear about them, because I think that we, as uh, an assembly, and have a duty and a responsibility to the elderly in our society, because it's well said that a society that cannot look after its elderly and its very young are not a credible society, and I stand behind that remark. 
I call Alistair Patterson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister thus far for his responses on this issue. But does the Minister accept that significantly more people, up to some 80 per cent of those reaching state pension age in 2016-17, are not going to have a better outcome under the new system? Would the Minister share my particular concerns about is the change and restriction to women drawing down from their husband's national insurance contribution that this could result in some not receiving a pension at all? Um, Deputy Speaker, can I thank the member for his question? And this is, a, I think, the first opportunity I've had to welcome him publicly, and, and I do so welcome him here to the House, and in particular, he now, like myself, represents probably the best constituency in Northern Ireland, namely from Alistair Tyrone, and I, I look forward to working with him on issues ahead. I share the, his concerns, but I want to say this, and, and I suspect the member knows it, but I think it's worth saying. Pensions are not a devolved matter. The pensions are arrived at in London, and so therefore, as the, this region of the United Kingdom, we are subject to the same pension control and conditions that prevail in London. So therefore, we do not set the rate of pensions. And could I say to the member, there was an attempt here some years ago uh, to raise the rate of pension. I think it was the Alliance Party come up with a suggestion that pensioners should all have an increase of five pounds. There wasn't one member spoke against it. That was until we asked the Alliance Party, where do you get the five pounds? And I think the answer was they said they didn't know. And they're still working on that one. And that's about 10 or 15 years ago, and they still haven't come up with the answer. But I share the concerns that you voice. Thank you. Moving on, I call David Hildage. Your question nine. The House and Executive has advised that anyone can buy mobility scooters privately, even if they do not meet the criteria for statutory wheelchair provision. In such circumstances, the Housing Executive would consider providing a ramp, but only after a thorough assessment of need by the Occupational Therapy Service. If the OT makes a recommendation for a ramp for a wheelchair user, the Housing Executive will undertake the work to the standards specified by the Occupational Therapist, subject to technical feasibility. I call David Hildes for supplement. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister. But can the Minister give an indication of the condition of that stock in Northern Ireland Housing Executive? Um, I thank the member for his question. The, the, the joint DSD NIHG uh, Asset Com Commission have provided the Housing Executive with comprehensive, robust data on the condition of its stock and a holistic understanding of its long-term future investment needs. As a result, the Housing Executive has drafted a new asset management strategy that sets out its long-term investment approach. This change of direction to adopting active asset management principles allows the Housing Executive to consider its investment priorities strategically in light of the likely funding that will be available and to focus on those assets with a clearly sustainable future in terms of demand and rental income. Moving on, I call Peter Weir. Uh, question number 10. Deputy Speaker, the Housing Executive has advised that in terms of insulation schemes in North Down, a cavity wall insulation scheme has been programmed in the Strand Avenue area in Hollywood as a result of particular issues arising in these properties. The current position is that Watts Group PLC have been appointed as consultants for the scheme and consultation with the residents is due to be carried out within the next two weeks. The Housing Executive <coughs> then expects to advertise and tender during March and April the scheme is due on site to commence in May of this year. And that is the end of our time for listed questions. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call David McNary.
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, a report today says uh, 6.7 billion is uh, needed to update the housing executive stock over the next 30 years, uh, with 1.5 billion required over the next five years. Minister, will you say where this is identified in the Fresh Start proposals in the number of new affordable homes to be built this year and within the next four years? Well, I thank the member for. I'm not sure where he gets uh, the, his figures or his uh, information from. Uh, I understand that Savile has been carrying out a very comprehensive report, and I'm looking forward to getting uh, sight of that report. Uh, I don't know whether the member has already got sight of it, but if he has, then he is certainly ahead of me. But let me be very clear: there are very, very big challenges ahead in relation to housing here in Northern Ireland. And I think that we are going to have to be, uh, what I would say, maybe more imaginary in the way that we fund uh, this issue in, in the future, because I believe that uh, there has to be a big change, a step change, in relation to our whole attitude to social sector housing here in Northern Ireland. I call David Nari. Well, uh, being ahead of the, the minister is certainly something um, would he say that as the housing executive uh, cannot borrow money and housing associations are already hi hi heavily committed financially, that he will not be proposing high rent increases despite whether he has or has not got this report today? Well, <laughs> Deputy Speaker, the member puts his finger on the issue. Now, I am not proposing high rent increases. As a matter of fact, I have proposed a zero rent increase just within the past few days. Now, I suspect there will be those who will criticise me for that, and there might even be those who will say it was the right thing to do. So, therefore, there is never an easy way forward on this one. But I will be making a statement in the not-too-distant future around this whole issue. And I am sure the member uh, will look forward to that, and he will undoubtedly want to ask questions uh, when that day comes. I call Karen McKevitt. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister to provide an update on the progress of welfare reform? Yes. Um, welfare reform, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a very topical subject at the moment, and it is something that I have been devoting a considerable amount of my time since I took over in social development just uh, four weeks ago or thereabouts. Um, but I can tell the member that uh, the regulations coming from the Welfare Reform Order 2015 are currently being prepared by my officials who continue to work with the Department of Works and Pension to enable the Welfare Reform regulations to be taken through Westminster. The first set of measures are planned to commence in May 2016, with subsequent measures anticipated to commence in June, the autumn and early 2017. So I can assure the member it is very active at the moment. I call Karen McEvitt. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister uh, to explain, in relation to the welfare reform, uh, how people with mental health uh, issues will be assisted when the mobility element uh, is also included in the mitigations. This is a, a, a major concern for a, a lot of people in my constituency. Uh, if I might say it is a very good question too. Uh, and can I say that there are two mobility activity, activity considered in PIP when determining entitlement. A is planning and following a journey and B is moving around. Now, planning and following a journey covers the difficulties experienced by people with learning difficulties, mental health problems, or sensory impairment. And furthermore, in such a scenario, people with mental health problems may score four points in the planning and following a journey criteria. I now call Nelson McCausland. Um, thank you. Could I ask the Minister for uh, an update? in relation to the work that is to be undertaken by the housing executive um, as regards Finlock gutters uh, on uh, houses in Silverstream and Tyndale in North Belfast. The same issue also arises in some houses in East Londonderry. Um, and he will be aware of the very serious issue 
of water penetration into those homes as a result of the effect of guttering over many years? Well, I thank the member for his question. And Fenlock guttering has been very much on the agenda in my department uh, of late. And can I say to the member this? This is not a straightforward one, because what we are grappling with here is a combination of two types of ownership, namely those who own their own home and those who rent their home. And very often they live under the same roof while they live in different houses. And so therefore we have to work on a solution of how this is all done in a way that creates the least amount of disturbance. But the member will undoubtedly be aware, during his time as minister, this problem was in existence also. And I know he worked hard on it to bring it up the agenda, which he did do. And I'm continuing to do that to bring uh, a result. And it is something that I will be concentrating on, and I am in the past, but even in the future, to get a solution to this difficult and vexed problem. I call Nelson McCausland. Um, I thank the Minister for his answer. And as he rightly says, uh, during the time when I was in the Department for Social Development, we didn't merely get it, on the agenda, or get it up the agenda, we actually got it onto the agenda because for 10 years the housing executive had actually denied that there was an issue uh, of defective guttering. And I am concerned um, that in the last number of days it has now emerged that some years ago 15 houses had their guttering replaced, which would seem to suggest that all those years ago there was an acknowledgement and an understanding within the executive of the nature of the problem, and yet publicly they persisted in saying that it was a matter of condensation within the houses. Would he ask the housing executive to investigate how this happened so we had a clear understanding of why there was such a long period of denial? Well, uh, I think the, the member makes the point well, and it, I can say to him this, that I have already asked the Housing Executive to provide a report on this to me. I am aware uh, of the situation as the member has outlined it, and I do look forward to receiving this report from the Housing Executive, and once I do, I will make it available to the member. And I call Robin Swan. Mr Deputy Speaker, and, uh, can I congratulate you? Firstly, I think this is the first exchange I've had with the Minister since he took up his post. Uh, following on from Ms McEvitt's question, can I ask the Minister, has he any indication when personal independence payments will be introduced into Northern Ireland? Well, can I thank the member for his question? I'm not sure whether I've taken a question from him before or not, but uh, I, he, he has decided to ask a very good question. I cannot give him the exact date as to when that will be, but what I will do is, when I get that, I will write to you and make that available to you, and hopefully that will be with you within days rather than weeks. Thank you. I call Robin Swan for supplementary. Thank you very much, Minister, and I appreciate your efficiency. So, but can I ask, has he any detail whether new claimants will be assessed under the current rules and regulations that's currently being used by DLA? Mr Deputy Speaker, the situation has changed, and I'm sure the member knows that. And so, therefore, it would be unwise for me to speculate at this particular moment. However, as I've said, that my officials are working virtually night and day uh, to bring this matter as swiftly as they possibly can, because it is an issue that has to be dealt with in a very expeditious manner. And I can assure the member, as he might have concerns around it, so do I, as a constituency. Uh, MLA, because what affects his constituents affects mine too. Moving on, I call Alistair Ross. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Last week, I joined with the Community Association in Monkstown Estate to view some of the housing executive stock. Uh, many people living in, in pretty desperate conditions, uh, in urgent need of, of maintenance. Can I ask the minister in that, uh, in that regard uh, what maintenance projects or programmes are planned for the Monkstown Estate in the near future? Well, thank the member for his question. The Housing Executive has advised that overall it has 502 properties in Monkstown. The Monkstown estate has benefited from a variety of schemes, including external cyclical maintenance, double glazing, 
and kitchen replacements worth a total investment of nearly £2.4 million within the past few years. I call Alistair Ross for supplement. I thank the Minister for that uh, answer and would encourage him to look at the, the current need in terms of maintenance for that uh, area and, and, and get a, a speedy progress to that. Can I ask him specifically around Abbey Town Square within that estate uh, and what money has been spent there, what plans there are to uh, have development or, or schemes in that area? I, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I do not have the amount of money that was spent in relation to Abbey Town Square, but I can tell him that the last ECM scheme was completed in 2009-10. The last kitchen scheme was completed in 2013. Thank you, Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. I would like to ask the Minister for any update that he has received on the Dales in Seymour Hill. Can I thank the member for her question? Um, well, in relation to the Dales and, uh, that the member speaks about, I understand that there has been two recent reports, and when I talk about recent, I'm talking about one as recent as November 2015, and I'm talking about another one as recent as 2000, uh, October uh, 2015. Now, I, I am aware that there is a problem in relation to damp and uh, condensation and other issues, and so therefore, once this report comes through, which I am expecting virtually any time, then I too will want to speak to the member in relation to that. I call Brenda Hill for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, I know you haven't had a chance yet to visit the Dales and see the dangerous and disgraceful state of them, and that has an executive been finding ways to say no, to do any updates rather, rather than to find a way to say yes. I have been to have a look, and it is so bad, damp rot spores growing on the wall. People shouldn't have to live in that condition. Poorly fit at windows 20 years ago. A heating system that doesn't work that's forcing people into fuel poverty. Minister, I want to give you these to show you how bad it is. I cannot believe people are living in such a state. What can you do to help the residents in Seymour could, Hill? Could I, could I highlight to members that this is not the normal that would happen during question time? You're certainly entitled to hand the information to the Minister, and that can be done outside of question time. So I would not wish to encourage other members to replicate su such issues. Minister, uh, I allow you an opportunity to answer. I apologise. Well, um, I, the member has handed material to me here, which I will have a look at. Uh, but a, 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 a quick, a, a, a quick, a quick glance at it does tell its own story. And as, I, as she has already said, I have not been out on the site, but I do know that my predecessor, Mr Storey, has been out on the site and has assessed it, and he too has declared that it is a matter of some urgency. And looking at those pictures, I think those confirm what both Mr Storey and what the member has said. I call Oliver McMahon. Can I ask the Minister to outline what plans his department has got to uh, present social, the, the social housing stock in rural East Antrim, especially along the Antrim coast and glens? What plans has he got to improve it? Well, I suspect that uh, rural East Antrim that he speaks about uh, is maybe not any different from rural Fermanagh South Tyrone, rural West Tyrone, rural uh, Armagh or any other rural area. But having said that, I suspect that it's, if it, it's not any better than those. And uh, I can assure the member that there is a continual appraisal of all social sector housing in uh, not only in his area, but right across Northern Ireland. And I look forward to getting a report on the condition of our social sector housing, not only in his constituency, but indeed on my own and everyone else's constituency here that's represented in this House today. I call over McMullen for a brief supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? But Minister, uh, uh, the, the housing stock hasn't, hasn't improved in this last 15, 20 years on the Antrim coast and the Glens area. Can I ask you to look into this here because we keep coming up with the only two sites in the whole area which are not available and uh, other sites that are. Can I ask you to look into this and uh, I would be too happy to have a meeting with you to discuss it. 
Corum Michael. Well, I thank the member for his question, but maybe what the member could do, he could maybe forward to me at uh, the earliest possible uh, his concerns outlining the estates that he is talking about and the houses that he has raised here today. Well, he hasn't mentioned them exactly, uh, but he has said about them on the coast, and I suspect the coast is a fairly long distance. But if he can send that to me or make me aware of it, then we'll certainly have a look at it and see what has to be done or what should be done. And that is the end of our period of questions to the Minister of Social Development, and we now move on to questions.